Hello guys, James here. Camera's moving kind of slow. Must be software. Anyway, I want to show you uh, another positive video on black people. This time, I'm going to show you three videos, and there's going to be some more coming up down the line. But this is this video is called America's First Black Owned Tiny Home Village. And this this man owns a village. Uh, for, for black people. For the last three years, thousands of trades, and their average win rate was 80 to 90 percent. We have hundreds of case studies. About to show you some the next case studies about a walk in the park. I'll explain more in our videos. Well so click so watch that said video, about book a demo with us, people. and we'll walk you through everything. And, and on top of these two traders that we have, we have, have coaches, seven-figure trading coaches that you can talk to every single day. Doctors. We have coaching sessions. We have everything you possibly need. Jaquita Wabit Rose, a.k.a. Chi Chi, and y'all are in for a treat today, okay, because we are here sitting with Mr. Booker T. Washington here at South Park Cottages in College Park. Is that correct? Yes. Is that where we are? Absolutely. Is that where we, we are. at? <laughs> we are that's what's home is. Yes, so Mr. Booker T., I want you to tell the people who you are, where you from, just give the people a little bit of who you are. Yeah, absolutely, First, thank you for the opportunity um, to talk about South Park Cottages. But uh, my name is Booker T. Washington. I'm the founder and CEO of Techie Homes and South Park Cottages, located here in College Park. Uh, I'm a native of Atlanta. I've lived in Atlanta for over three decades. And uh, this community is representative that we'll talk about today of where I grew up. Yes. So, listen, when we first um, came out here, Marcy, myself, who is the executive producer of the show, we were so blown away by your testimony. We were blown away at how you started, the idea, how it all unfolded. Right. So I want you to just be you. Okay. I want you to tell your story because right. nobody can tell it like you can tell it. Okay, I can't even ask the question. Right. Um, so I want you to just share with the people, how did this vision come to pass? Well, this vision really came to pass of creating um, this historic community, South Park College, really because as a child I grew up in these same neighborhoods where uh, College Park and South Park is located. Um, I was a child of a single parent. Uh, we moved around from apartment to apartment in all of South Fulton. And as I grew older and got a chance to work in other areas of life, I noticed that the neighborhoods I grew up in didn't change, although a lot of the other areas of Atlanta changed. And I started asking questions of why. Why didn't it change? Why wasn't change happening fast enough? And who was dictating that change? And so the common denominator I came down to was actually developers and real estate owners weren't making that change happen. And so I took matters into my own hands and started designing a makeup of home ownership in this new economy that happened. Beautiful. Now let me let me say this. What I enjoyed when we first met you. Yeah. Um, was how you were said. You said you were sitting around a table, you and a couple of friends. Yeah. And this was how many years ago? This was just two and a half, three years ago. Two and a half, three years ago. And now we're looking at a whole community, a whole community yeah. <laughs> in College Park where you grew up. Yeah, where I grew up. Exactly yes. on the street where you used to what play I, ball. I used to bicycle. <laughs> I used to bicycle down where South Park was located. It's located in the dead end of College Park on mm -hmm. Godby Road. Now Godby Road is infamously known for maybe not the right thing. But now in this dead end, it's going to be known for a lot of positive things, a lot yes. of change. And that's just because we chose to take a lot of action, to be honest with you. 
Yes, and what I love um, mostly is how you are impacting the very community that you were raised in. And what I love about what you're saying is, so I have a 22 year old son. And sometimes to that generation, home ownership looks very bleak. It doesn't look like it's possible because of the housing market and how expensive it is. So what you're doing is you're giving hope to people to another generation that it's possible. It's possible for home ownership, especially with our black community, especially with our young black you know, men and women. Absolutely. This is so important and crucial for them to be able to see this. Um, tell people how old you are. I am 39 years old. Oh. Come on, 39. And I will begin developing South Park. I was 37, 38. Why well, I want to shut that door. That wind, is, that noise is going to be loud. He's 39 years old. Wow. So that's a great example. You see how that door is cut off? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. The insta. You see, you see how it went from all that wind and all that noise to no noise? No noise. Instantly. The installation is really amazing. Yes. Well, so can I ask you a question? So is that a part of like your, like how, when you built it or when you designed it, is that a part of your, was that a part of your plan? Like yeah, all that you're all telling in Look, because this is again for growing up in those bad apartments. Yes. What's, what was your complaints when? Upstairs, somebody the knocking, the, bro. the banging, <laughs> yes. the noise transfer, yes. how it can still be cold in your house when you come home. Yes. Mm-hmm. How it's still hot in your house when you come home yes. and nothing stays <laughs> climate control. Uh-huh. So all those things in my mind, I put into my bills. So I study, okay, what keeps the cold cold outside and the hot hot inside? Oh, you know what? Insulation. So we upgraded walls to an above R30 insulation. The standard insulation per building code is R13. So a builder can give you R13 and says, thank you, have a good day. I gave you what's required. Uh But we did more than what's required. Because what mattered to me was long-term value on what we wanted to create. So that's what you feel and sense in this house. We have double soundproof doors that have glass in them that are one inch thick. So we can provide you the same openness and visibility outside, but the comforts and the climate control inside. So you can enjoy your space. So although in this model home, we have open construction happening outside, you could literally take a nap or go to sleep in this home right now. Right now. As construction would continue because you're blocked from all the doors. And don't hear anything. And you don't hear anything. It's all sheltered out. Yes. So I mean, that's what I mean about your vision, like the integrity mm-hmm. and building the house, not just say, "Huh, here, here's the house." No. <laughs> no, it's like let me give you something quality, because this is long term. This it's is long term. When you think long term investment, you want quality. You Correct. want your house to be built where it's like you said, built to last. Last. Well, yes. so you want it to be uh, able to be maintenance. You want yes. it to be durable, yes. and by durability, I mean things you're not replacing often. Things you're not complaining about often. There's a lot of things you can't change. And one thing you really can't change is once your house is built and the walls are closed up, you can't change a lot about what's inside the walls unless you're willing to take the big expense. Mm -hmm. So why build something long term that creates a big expense for somebody cutting down their ability to create wealth? Mm -hmm. Remember, the mission is about long term visions of people creating wealth, equity, and home ownership yes. by value. That's good. And so that's the reason why we build the kind of thing. So other updates we have in our homes, of course, is we are called Techie Homes for a reason. Okay. So within the tech and the insulation and different initiatives we have, we also feature um, ceiling fans that are Bluetooth and have recessed lights and have innovations of retracting ceiling fan bla- uh, blades. And the entire home has LED lights throughout. So this is a micro home of 630 square feet, but it features over 30 recess lights wow. in the ceiling. That is amazing. Yes. Now, and let's not talk about the um, daylight, the natural so lighting. Light. <laughs> the natural lighting that comes through in the one inch thick um, UV protected um, modern glass provides people with the comforts of climate control inside, the savings of their utility bills, yes. Because if a person, this community and these homes should save an average homeowner of close to $2,500 per year wow. in energy savings wow. because of the initiatives and uh, sustainabilities that we put into the homes. Yes. 
that $2,500, if they were to actually take that savings and apply it to their mortgage principal, mm -hmm. they would cut their mortgage from 30 years to 20 years. Just because the home they live in provided them a vehicle to find savings, but that's also because we designed a home with intentionality to provide those savings. Uh, you don't find builders, a lot of builders or, you know, who think developers who think like that. Because like you said, yes. we're just trying to get you a house, take the money, money and go, go to the next, next right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Man, this is so beautiful. I love this. What other... Um... So other, other initiatives we have in our home is um, as we walk into the kitchen here, um, all of our um, faucets are modern looking, of course, but they're also touch faucets. Okay. So you can touch them and the water turns on. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Because okay. we that. know that in our busy lives, mm -hmm. sometimes we have full hands. Yes. And by living with full hands, we wanted to both give the option of the standard way of turning on your faucet and also the ability of touch faucet and so it can turn on. I love the automatic upgrades. Yes. Okay. When, when I purchase a home, I'm, all, I'm automatically upgraded. Okay? <laughs> yes. I don't have to be upgraded. Yeah, no, yes. Upgraded. You're all upgraded. <laughs> so, and then we wanted to make sure we knew at the, uh, at the price point we were at yeah. for affordability mm -hmm. that we gave them, um, you know, products that were seen in homes that they've seen more upgraded. Gotcha. Yeah, right? Absolutely. So, for another example of that is our farmhouse sinks. Mm -hmm. Um, better than a traditional sink mm -hmm. because it's wider, it's deeper. Yes. Um, so if you're cutting vegetables or you're doing multiple things in your sink because, again, it's a home. Right. So uh, we want you to be able to enjoy your kitchen. Yes. We want you to be able to cook in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. So we want you to be able to use the sink functionally, right? Of course, we have a dishwasher and other appliances that will be in the home. But this allows you a much better function to have guests over or if you're a family size above one. So that's another update. That love we it. I love it. All right. So we'll go in the bathroom here. You come on in. <laughs> All right. So if you're in the bathroom and you're looking across at this, you're looking at from floor to ceiling tile in the shower. Okay. When is the last time you've seen that in your apartment? Ooh, no. Never. Okay. <laughs> um, we also include as a standard a body shower and an overhead shower in the bathtub shower you look yes so you're in remember you're in a 630 square foot micro home that's featuring you finishes like you would get in a hotel yes or yes i love this yes. oh my gosh the details it's the, in the details in the details okay <laughs> in the details. Uh, we also feature efficient um slow clothes uh, modern as you can see modern sink and toilets Love so it. above grade type toilets yes. for efficiency because we want to control the water usage as well as look fitting to yes. the modern home we have. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you what I love about this as a mother. When I have to tell my son, stop slamming my stomach. Did you hear any noise? <laughs> I as hear no noise. No, no noise. No so noise. mothers, single mothers, moms, y'all yes. are going to love this for the kids. Okay? Yes. No noise, right? <laughs> Again, part of just what you remember, you're still in a micro home. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay? We're two people yes. inside the bathroom of a micro home, and you don't feel squished yes. or quaint or anything at all. At all right? Mm -hmm. And then the one feature I know you love mm -hmm. is going to be our vanity. I knew it. Mirror. I was looking at it from the side of my eye. I was right. side eyeing this thing. <laughs> so, as a standard, we provide the featured vanity mirror that has LED lighting embedded. It is a warming vanity mirror and touch vanity mirror that will never fog as you're in the shower. <gasps> so when you get out the shower, this is beautiful. that wiping of the window, yes. the mirror, uh -huh. and the <laughs> fogging, <laughs> and the brush your teeth, yes. you don't I have to do that uh, in a South Park Cottages micro home. Amazing. That oh is standard gosh. and available to you. And is this gonna be just gonna be standard throughout the other phases? Standard throughout all phases, because part of our tech influences is efficiency and sustainability. Yes. And one thing about quality of life is enjoying where you live and having pride of ownership. Okay. And to create pride of ownership, you have to love the quality of what you have Absolutely. and want to provide extra effort into being in it. Right. Yes. So if I give in quality finishes and quality updates at a price that is affordable. Remember, the average mortgage is fourteen to $1,500. Right. So if you're providing them these pieces of affordability and 
quality in their lives, they're more apt to have pride, they're more apt to live in it longer, That's so true. and they're more apt to pass it down to family or sell it in pride for long-term value. Absolutely. And the person that is purchasing it in resale yeah. is more likely to purchase it in resale because what? It is built in quality. Yeah. Wow. And since NJM operates as a mutual, they don't have to answer to shareholders, which means they... Okay. You be careful, don't you? Oh, no. Okay, so we're going upstairs. Yes. And this is what, um, which floor plan is this? This is the Valentina floor plan that features a one loft and a one bedroom. Okay. So you are now in the one loft area of the Valentina. Now remember, you are still in 630 square feet. Okay? So this one loft area features a 10 by 14 size room, has 10 foot ceiling, has recessed lights throughout. It can fit, as you can see, a full size sofa or more, and also another sitting area or television or office. It can be converted into a bedroom if you wanted to make it another bedroom area. Um, and of course, we feature the one bedroom right across from it. The beautiful feature of the Valentina is it features a deck off yeah. the main love, love, love. of 16 feet. Oh my gosh. So if we walk out to the deck here, well, it's cold out there, right? it is a little cold. Oh, is it? I don't know. Oh, okay. Yep. So as you can see, this 16 foot deck out here. Is another experience point on day. great weather wow. days inside of a home that's still again 630 square feet. Amazing. Look at the view. Then oh. you have these views, and then you can tell the difference on this cold weather day uh -huh. <laughs> on the difference of weather and sound as we close the door. Well insulated. Yeah, well insulated. <laughs> so uh, as we walk here into the bedroom, you have here the bedroom. That features what you have is a full queen size bed. Um, remember, we're two people in a room, uh, 630 square feet. You have floor to ceiling natural light coming through. Yes. As we open up these curtains to this view, if you open up these windows here, all right, and you're looking at all this natural light flowing in. You see how your melanin is glowing? Yeah, I'm glowing. You're right, you, you are in a 630 square foot home that features all the comforts that you would have in any dwelling that you would be in. But the difference here in this size of home at the right family size for you is that you own this and you can own this and it's an affordable piece of home ownership at fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars a month. at a level that hasn't been seen because that's what we choose to do. And this features, again, 10-foot ceilings, LED lights throughout, um, dimming systems, and efficient windows to allow for uh, energy efficiency. So oh it's just a great opportunity to to just sit back, relax, and imagine waking up to oh, all this, this natural all light. All I've been thinking about. Yes. Okay, I was like, oh. My God, yes. I can wake up to this. All of that. So it's so funny. Let me tell you. So I always said my next house, I was like, I want to be in my house facing east. <laughs> yes. Because I love the sun, like the sunrise in the morning. Yes. I love my next house. Nothing but windows. Yes. I just want windows. Nothing but natural light. I and love look, it. On That's a day when the sun is easy. coming through, I could turn off mm -hmm. my heater system. Yes. Because I feel the heat. And feel the warmth <laughs> yes. come through mm -hmm. in a room. Because it's just well built. It's just well built. Like even right now, standing in the drawing room, it's warm. Yes. And that's because of the natural light, light coming through. In and there's no heat in, in this room right now. Yeah, and no on a cold weather yeah. day, you're saving yourself money 
by not powering your HVAC systems in order to just live where you, where you want to. And that's another reason why in intentionality we faced all the houses the way we did and provided all the windows up front. Uh, man, so you so you were strategic in how you yes. faced them. Yes, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't guess at it. Um, when I when I wrote it and when I looked at the site, I wanted to make sure from intentionality and where yes. the sun rose and where it's set, yes. that you had great views yes. and that you had great appeals to your home. I love it. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, you can't really get this, man. Come on. <laughs> I got it in real estate four or five years ago. And working at Tesla in the Bay Area of California, where Tesla is located, where it's, where it's has a big housing crisis. Mm, yes. But the other thing about California is people there do make fairly good incomes, but they are the working poor. They, they, they're people that make well over six figures that are homeless wow. in California. Oh so that said, and I was walking with the leader of Tesla, uh, Elon Musk, um, he was talking about building housing for plant work mm. and affordable housing. And we walked and we talked about numbers of what that, that affordable house looked like. It was like well over 700000 And when he said it, I, I said, if that in his mind is affordable, you know, I started thinking about my own communities and how to impact them. Because the one thing, love or hate Elon Musk, he is a dreamer and he is a dreamer of purpose. And I say love and hate, the one thing that to a fault is that he's going to dream and he's going to act upon that dream, right? Okay, so for me, it's, it's fucked to me because I've always talked about doing something for my neighborhood, but we talk about it in circles. Oh, I want to do this. Oh, that's wrong. Oh, what happened is what's happening to our black people. Oh, that's wrong. Who's in charge? Who can make this change? And the more and more I kept going in that circle, yeah. I said, oh, the person that's about to change, the change is me. So, uh, I, during the pandemic, started doodling um, this community on a piece of paper and said, I'm going to go back to Atlanta and I'm going to create this community. So, I quit my job. I came back to Atlanta and I started drawing up the version of where this is going to be. And when I found the perfect land, which was instantaneous where South Park sits. I knew it was going to be built here. We started buying it and we started building it. And that's how it all worked out. It, was, it became, I got tired. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. coming back to my neighborhood and noticing no one was going to make a change. So, you ever heard of saying, you know, when the going gets tough and I'm so tired of being tired? Yeah. I was tired of being yeah. tired. Mm -hmm. And I was tired of asking somebody who was going to do it. And I realize that, you know, the person that's going to do it, it might have to just be me. That's me. And that's okay. And so I went to talk about it. And I woke up one day with a thought clear as day um, from the Lord. And I just started doing it. And because if you've ever, if you've noticed thus far our, our, our community and our walk, um, you've never seen me with a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Ever. <laughs> no. Right? No notes. Because yep. um, if what you know is what you know. That's it. It's in here. Um, and it's in here. And it's ingrained in here. And I just want to live it out in its construction and in its purpose. That's another reason why I'm so heavily involved. But for our youth and for our inspiration for our kids, what they got to see is the work. Yeah. Right? Right. Not just the results. Mm -hmm. Not just the bling and the flash. And uh, I want the kids to stop skipping over the required piece of the work oh, so in order to get the result. I love it. Yeah, uh, well, you can find me on Instagram primarily at Mr. Underscore Booker Underscore T, or you can find the community of South Park on Instagram at Techie Homes, and that's T I C H I E Homes, and you can find us both there. And we engage, we, we ask you to connect, we ask you to join us in our movement, um, we ask you to either invest or purchase a home in our community because our mission will continue and the history will continue. Also find us at our website, um, www.southparkcottages.com. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. So we out here.
That's a good idea. That's where it starts at. Building and protecting but it's something about black people that it irks people and they really Stock don't think that and rising inflation have left they, investors they, they with too smart. Options. Well, watch this. Ground floor is here to help. The exploration of Africa by Europeans, all they could see is that everybody had the same skin color. So when they divided up the world by races, they just say black African. And that became a bin into which they put every person they ever found in Africa. Because they saw skin color. They weren't seeing anything else though. Other elements of genetic diversity, of genetic expression. If all you see is skin color, you'll miss things like height, or intelligence, or motivation. Other things that could be encoded within a person, within a group. Now watch. All evidence shows that life began in Africa and later left Africa to go into Europe, across into Asia, the land bridge into North America and South America. But all began in Africa. You would expect the greatest genetic diversity of the human species to be expressed in Africa. That's what you'd expect. Because it all began there. Okay? So what do I mean by genetic diversity? Is it skin color? Because that's what everyone thinks about when it no. That, Forget skin color. Forget it. I'm talking about other features you can measure about people. So, if you have the greatest genetic diversity, where would you find the tallest person in the world? It'd be in Africa. You got the Watus. Where would you find the shortest person in the world? It would be in Africa. You got the pigmies. Where would you find the fastest person in the world? You find him in Africa. You're getting him off the west coast of Africa. Yeah. Where would you find the fastest at Long distance with stamina. You find it in Africa. It's a different part of Africa. You get that from Kenya, which is on the uh, well, east coast. You get the uh, sprinters on the west coast. Okay? Uh, if you wanted to find the slowest person in the world, it would be in Africa, but there's no contest for that. Okay? Um, if you wanted to find the dumbest person in the world, however you want to measure it, it would be in Africa. So the most intelligent person. The most intelligent person in the world would be in Africa. And in fact, there is a project called the Africa Einstein Project. And they are looking for the next Einstein in Africa. Because that's where you're going to find the smartest person there ever was in the world. But but historically, Europeans are not thinking that Africa is going to have smart people because that's not how they were represented ever. Okay? There's a This was written about, uh, Stephen Gould wrote about this book, The Mismeasure of Man. There's a shelf in the British Museum that has... Uh, a brain in a jar is the brain of a famous uh, a psychologist, anthropologist, Roca. Okay? And next to it, on, on another shelf, is the, are the genitals of a black male African in a jar. Well, that kind of says it all. You, did you save the brain of the African? No, you saved his genitals. Did you save the genitals of Roca? No, you saved his brain. Wait! As an African, on one hand, you may be happy that our continent is having the smartest people in the world, the tallest people in the world, the fastest people in the world, yeah, probably the most beautiful people in the world. But on the other hand, we are having the shortest people, the dumbest people, the ugliest people. This is a big problem for Africa, and if you give me a moment, I'm going to explain. No? Okay, I'm listening. You see, human minds naturally pay attention to the negative. Why we, over time, ignore the positive. Psychologists call this negativity bias. So, because of negativity bias, if you have any environment, in this case, a continent, where you are having a stream of positivity, and extreme of negativity, what happens is humans we naturally see more of the negative. Uh, most of the times, they will not see the positive at all. I'm going to talk more on this later in the video. For now, let me try and show you practically how negativity bias affects human mind. Look at this lady. She's beautiful. Oh, yeah. She's beautiful. Yeah. Let's pretend that 
you are this lady and you dressed up in the morning, uh, immediately you step out of your house, somebody look at you and said, wow, your hair is beautiful. Now, naturally you will say, oh, thank you. But you are happy about that compliment, right? Okay, but three hours later, another person look at you and say, oh, uh, where did you make this hair from? It is, it is horrible. Now, you have received one compliment about your hairstyle and one negative comment about your hairstyle once you assume that the negative and positive should cancel each other unfortunately when you are about to sleep at night you are very much unlikely to remember the positive comment but you will remember the negative comment because your brain as human tend to exaggerate the negative why most of the time it just ignore the positive let me give you another example let's say you grab your phone and you write some poem on facebook twitter or whichever platform you use and 30 minutes later you discover that five people had commented on your post but while reading through the comments of the people, you discover that four of those comments are positive. They are telling you how great your post is, how good it is, and you know, good things like that. But then you saw this negative comment. What do you think will happen to you immediately? When? What happened is your mind automatically forgets the positive comment and concentrate on the negative comment and in fact i would not be surprised if in the next three weeks you are still remembering that person who dropped a negative comment on your facebook post That's but true. remember you actually received four positive comments why can't you remember those the reason is because again human mind naturally exaggerates the negative why we ignore the positive That's okay true. now let's go right. back to talk about africa don't forget we are talking about the fact that africa is having genetic diversity which means you have in the same environment the smartest people at the same time the dumbest people you are having the tallest people at the same time the shortest people Probably you are having the most beautiful people. At the same time, you are having the ugliest people. Unfortunately, when you have such environment, what happens is everybody hates from the rest of the world tend to forget all those positives. Why they see the negatives as being the only thing that exists in that environment. Just as 30 days after somebody dropped a negative comment on your Facebook post, you are still remembering that negative comment. Even though there are five positive comments, you are forgetting. They exist. In their 2001 study, it was published in St. Jonah. Professor of Psychology Paul Rosen and Dr. Edward Rosman called the phenomenon I just described to you now negativity dominance and the idea is negative and positive even if they are at the same measure negative always dominates mm. positive in the mind of human so the implication of that for africa is that everybody from the rest of the world we naturally not see the positive side of Africa. They will naturally see the negatives. And because they tend to see the negatives alone, they would think we are not capable of any exceptional mental capacity. People want to say the aliens built the pyramids, yeah. and I'm saying, no, Africans built the pyramids. And you're European, come to Africa, and it's some technology, some architecture that's beyond your capacity, and you're going to say aliens did it because uh -huh. you will not credit Africa uh -huh. for having that kind of ability? Uh -huh. I see you.
What's yes, wrong with okay. you? Okay, I see that. And sometimes when they want to credit us for anything, they can naturally or easily see that we are stronger because we are who's in both of this world, or we are Muhammad Ali of this world, or they ridiculously think we have bigger genitals. If you've been a photographer for more than seven days and you still don't take photos like this. But I'm, I'm gonna come back to that. But I'm gonna give you another insight into Yeah, that's, that's crazy, ain't it? What he says is true. Ladies and gentlemen, they just did a recent finding and it says that in counties where there are more black doctors, black people tend to live longer. I'm not surprised. We really do get better care when we go to doctors that are not uh, them folks. We actually do a lot better. You know, it, it's even found if you have a foreign doctor opposed to them folks, you do a lot better. So, you know, they got a tendency of blowing us off because they are caught in condition not to take us seriously. That's why that is the case. So uh, black people in county with more black primary physicians tend to live longer, according to a new national analysis that provides the strongest evidence yet that increasing the diversity of the medical workforce may be key to ending deeply entrenched racial health disparities. And we know, you know, medical apartheid, we know all about it. The study published Friday is the first to link a higher prevalence of black doctors to longer life expectancy and lower mortality in black populations. Other studies show that when black patients are treated by black doctors, they are more satisfied with their health care. I know I am. I know I am. That is the truth. Um, it, it, it does make a difference. That black doctor will spend more time with you and they will go over a lot of just daily things you should be doing to keep your health up. They will go over um, like your entire chart with you and, and give you recommendations on what kind of meds you should be taking. They are very thorough and I noticed that. It, it is way more thorough than the doctor I had even 20 years ago and he was not a black doctor. All he did was schedule everybody to come at the same time and run between room to room. You did not get good care. I was never satisfied with that. And they do that to this very day. That's why I don't go see them folks anymore. Mm -mm. It is, they, they give you the worst possible care. They don't give you the best care. And they don't care. They give you any old flimsy old care and you're supposed to be satisfied with that. But I'm glad y'all, um, a lot of our people are looking for black doctors that never looked for them before. I noticed that too. Um, but just know this is the truth. This is the truth get way better care when the doctor looks just like you. The care is way better. Okay. And other studies it shows that black patients are treated by black doctors 
are more satisfied with the health care, more likely to have received preventive care they needed in the past, and more likely to agree to recommended preventive care, such as um, blood tests and you know, and, and getting the proper medication that you should be on. A lot of times, you know, when you're going to them folks, you're taking all kinds of meds that you shouldn't even be on. But none of that research has been shown to impact um, black life expectancy. Until now, the new study finds that black residents in counties with more black doctors, whether or not they are actually seeing those doctors had a lower mortality from all causes. So they're talking about heart disease, diabetes, uh, your high blood pressure, you know, the things that impact the black community the most, they had a lower mortality rate. So people were living longer and had better health when black doctors were in the county. The findings of longer life expectancy persisted even in counties with a single black physician. So just having one black doctor in the county made a difference in the overall health of the black residents. Wow. Residents that live there. So uh, that's a single black physician in a county can have an impact on the entire population mortality and it's stunningly overwhelming. Said Monica Peak, a primary care physician and health equity researcher for the University of Chicago Medicine wrote in an editorial accompanying a new study. It validates that people in health equity have been saying, you know, what they've been saying all the time, that black physicians are important, but to see the impact at the population level is astonishing. It is astonishing, but not surprising y'all you like I said if you don't have a black doctor or there are none around you you know just make sure you can research online or if you can call a medical um, facility near you and see if they got black doctors you can do that that's not against the law and you should do it This is adding to the case for a more diverse physician workforce. But you know, black doctors are not treated well out here. You know, I, I think they probably can get by a little better if they have their own practice. But if they work up at many of these hospitals and medical centers and stuff, they're not treated well. And, and we've seen those videos online. They're not. So, um, they're saying the American Association of Medical Colleges and one of the co-authors, what else could you ask for than asking for a, a more diverse uh, medical workforce? You can say something. You know, I remember in the past, especially when I had my appendix taken out, it was a group of surgeons and they were all white males there were no nothing I, I don't even think they had one Chinese or even an, an East Indian they certainly didn't have no black doctor but I noticed it was a lot of them around New Jersey at that time you just saw these group of physicians or group of surgeons and they were just all white males that was, that was a very common thing to see but I notice now, you know, in this date and time, I do notice a little more diversity. 
than I ever seen before in the past. So would I trust a black doctor more than any other doctor out here? I absolutely would. I absolutely would. And I, I have a black doctor and I get great care. Even when we were on lockdown, whenever anything was wrong, all I had to do was pick up the phone. That was it. And never made me feel like I had to rush off the phone because he had other people to call. Nothing like that. Great care. Very thorough. But y'all, please tell me what you think. We're going to go back to business now. What happened? And this is the same person speaking. You for moms from the number one doctor recommended Lisa Cabrera. brand. She talks about what happened to this business. They were in talks with a permanent tenant. 
after the news made the rounds on social media, reports came in that the business would be staying. Uh huh. Okay, so they were afraid they might lose business and how bad this looks. Up the road in Durham, another business owner experienced a similar thing. Last year, a popular sneaker and specialty clothing store, Sir Castle Tees, was forced to close after, after the mall served him eviction papers without warning. So he earned over a million dollars in sales in a six month period. Wow. So he was doing well. This kind of, you know, in my opinion, this looks like a case of jealousy. Every one of these businesses that I'm telling you about were in malls and they were doing exceptionally well, owned by black business owners. All right, all of them doing exceptionally well. Somebody that made a million dollars in a six month period can pay the lease. So owner Michael Phillips felt he was targeted for being good at what he does and a shooting that caused a lot of chaos. We are definitely the hot commodity because we do everything that everybody wants on the internet, Phillips told ABC 11. The source reported that the shooting happened somewhere near Phillips' store. He, he wasn't responsible for no shooting. Yeah, it might have happened near his store, but that doesn't make him responsible for it. As for Tally, since news of her lease termination broke, the mall management has asked her to come back. Wow. From the brewers of Summer Shandy, Juicy Peach, ripe for drinking anytime. Wine and Google's flavor the moment. Termination broke. The mall management has asked her to come back to South Point. However, she's not sure if she wants to make the commitment again. Wait a minute. You went through the trouble of asking this woman that you see in the picture to leave you the mall broke the lease she didn't break the lease and her lease was not up but they wanted her gone now they want her to come back you know what it is it hit the news and they look bad in the whole process but you know i never knew this was going on until i saw this story I had no idea that all of these black business owners were being forced out of these malls and no explanation given. And each one of them were doing exceptionally well. That says a lot. This sounds like just jealousy crap. That's all. You know, we have been subjected to sabotage this entire time. And this just looks like another case. Okay, they're doing well. You know, they don't want us to do well in the Gentile kingdom. So when one of us are doing well, then, you know, you know what happens. They have to come along and sabotage everything up because they're mad that you are still making it despite all of the roadblocks that are thrown in our faces. And they hate seeing that. And I'm sure these folks, their stores probably looked really nice up in these malls as well. No, they don't want to see all of that. But I'm glad some of them have come out on social media and mainstream news to report what's happening all over this country. You know, there were a few uh, black owned businesses in the mall that was around me but that mall has been gone a long time ago you know and I did um, shop a couple of their stores the last time I was up there so I know these business owners are there it may not be as many as we see you know as far as other people are concerned but they are there in many cases 
So, you know, I wish them the best. I hope they can, if they don't go back to the same malls, the ones that have been kicked out, I hope they can maybe open up their own storefront, you know, to keep their business going or bring the business onto the internet and let everybody know. You know, I know a lot of us are looking to shop black. But y'all, please tell me what you think about this story. Please leave your comment and subscribe. Don't forget to hit on the notification bell. And this is why we need this. Right here.
Falls. And for that, to prove this out, fam, we're going to take a look at the UK Parliament, right? United Kingdom's Parliament, the, uh, the House of Commons, right? The guests on Don Lemon's show brought up the fact that England was the first to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. Let's take a look at how that came to be, right? So let's take a look at the actual abolishing of the transatlantic slave trade. And what you have to realize, fam, before that happened, there were some petitions that were made in order to abolish this transatlantic slave trade. So basically, what you're looking at on your screen, you're looking at a book. It's called An Abstract or the Evidence Delivered Before the Select Committee of the House of Commons in the years 1790 and 1791. So basically, this was the evidence that was delivered, given to the House of Commons as a petition to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. So what we're going to do, fam, we're going to go through this information, this evidence that was given to the House of Commons to see if Hillary Fordwich was right. We're going to see who they said was the root of slavery, who they said was the catalyst of slavery over in Africa. And fam, if you don't know, this is an old book. This was a book that was published roughly, I believe, in 1791 or 1792. And it's important, fam, that if, when you're doing your history, if you're new to this channel, one of the things that we do is that we like to go and grab old books where the publication date is from the 1850s or older. The reason why we go and get these old books is because the history of those books ends up being totally different than the present day narrative. And this is a perfect example, right? So we're going to use their books. We're going to use the House of Commons in the UK to show you who the root of the supply chain in Africa is. All right. If you can see the book on your screen, so this is a free book in Google. And again, the name of the book is an abstract of the evidence delivered before the select committee of the House of Commons in the years 1790 and 1790. One, let me get the rest of that uh, title here because it is a long title. It says, On the part of the petitioners for the abolition of the slave trade. All right. So we're going to read this book to uh, see who they say was responsible for the slave trade in Africa. So as we read the preface, it says, In consequence of the numerous petitions which were sent to Parliament from different countries, cities, and towns of Great Britain, Year 1788 for the abolition of the slave trade. It was determined by the House of Commons to hear evidence upon that subject. The slave merchants and planters accordingly brought forward several persons as witnesses. The first in behalf of the continuance of the slave trade, the latter in defense of the colonial slave trade. These were heard and examined in the years 1789 and 1790. Let's continue on the next page. It says, the evidence for Africa and the Middle Passage on the side of the petitioners of Great Britain is given by persons who have been to almost all the conspicuous parts of Africa from the River Senegal to Angola. So in other words, fam, basically they're saying that the evidence that these petitioners are bringing forth is evidence brought forth from first-hand accounts from people who were there in Africa along all the different places and stops of the transatlantic slave trade can't get any better than this family when it comes to sources. You are going to hear directly from the people who were there during that time as presented again to the House of Commons. I just want to stress that, ma'am. This was presented to the British government. All right? So let's keep reading. It says, many of them have had great opportunities of information from having been resident on shore or having been up and down the several rivers or from having made each of them several voyages. Among these, as well as among those who have only had the opportunity, perhaps, of a single voyage, or to be reckoned that several respectable persons of education, observation, and leisure. And it is to be observed that the information of the whole goes to things at different periods from the year 1754 to 1789. The evidence, again, for the West Indies and America are numerous and respectable. Many of them have had the advantage of being resident there for years, and the information which they have given extends to things as they were at various times from 1753 to 1790. So again, fam, they're telling us that these people were there, right? These people were there. Let's keep reading. It says, the editor, on the other hand, feels it incumbent upon him to acknowledge that some of them came up as evidence from a sense of duty. 
right? So they're coming up with their own free will. It says, and this is against their own apparent interests and under the threats of suffering considerably for such a conduct. In other words, fam, they're taking a risk in giving this testimony before the parliament, before the House of Commons. This is a testimony that we are going to read to answer the question, who or what was the root of slavery in Africa? Was it the African chiefs or was it something else? Let's see what the House of Commons heard as far as the first-hand account testimony. So for that, we're going to take a brief look at the alphabetical list of the names of the witnesses examined by the select committee of the House of Commons. We're not going to go through the whole list, but I'm just going to highlight just a few names just so that you can see where these people are from and how long they've resided in certain places. And forgive me if I butcher these names, but you can see the names on your screen like Bailey, resided 25 years in South Carolina and Georgia, or Beverly, was born in Virginia and lived there the first 16 years of his life. Or both of them, it says, went to the West Indies in 1770 and about two years visited all the islands, English and France, and was employed by the government in Granada. Or Bowman was in Africa employed from 1765 to 1776, so roughly 11 years, mostly on the Windward Coast as third, second, and chief mate. And Claffin was upwards of 20 years in Maryland. And just a few more of these, fam. It says, or in Davies, who resided at Barbados 14 years, the three last learning the management of a sugar estate. All right, so you can see the rest of the... If you get a chance, fam, just make sure you, you download this book. I really stress families for all so-called African-Americans, all so-called Negroes, get this book, fam, because this book will tell you the real deal as far as what happened during the transatlantic slave trade. And trust me, fam, it will be a little bit different than what you have learned in your schools. Even though this is first-hand testimony given to the actual government in England, this information is usually not found in the textbooks. This information is not used to talk. All right, let's see. The lesson here, fam, is make sure you get this book. I'm not going to go through the whole book, of course, fam. I'm just going to highlight a few things. If you get a chance, get this book, read it at your leisure, fam. And that way, if someone comes to you, an alternative narrative as far as what happened, you will be armed to be able to set the record straight. All right, so let's keep going, fam. Here we go. Let's see. Uh, in the first section, we're going to read about the African participation in slavery, right? Let's read about what they did, right? So we're going to confirm the first part of what she said, right? The first part of what Hillary said. And what you see on the screen is in chapter one. It says, the enormities committed by the natives of Africa on the persons of one another to mature slaves for the Europeans proved by the testimony of such as have visited the continent and confirmed by accounts from the slaves themselves after their arrival in the West Indies. So remember, we are looking for the supply chain, right? If you're not familiar with the supply chain, basically you have a supplier, and he's trying to get it to the buyer, right? And in this case, in this diagram, you have the supplier on the left, Africa, and you have the shopper, the buyer, England, on the right. Right. So this is the supply chain that Hillary pointed out during her interview with uh, Don Lemon. But we're going to see if the supply chain that was described that you see on the screen is correct. But first, like we said, let's take a look at what the Africans did. Right? Let's take a look at their action in the transatlantic slave trade. And it reads, the trade for slaves, says Mr. Kiernan, in the River Senegal was chiefly with the Moors on the northern banks who got them very often by war. Now, just to pause here, fam, what you always heard in school was that they always got their slaves by war. We're going to talk about that in chapter two. But this confirms what we've been taught in school, right? This confirms what we've learned so far. This is also what the part that Hillary is talking about. But the question is, is this step one or is this step five, right? Well, let's keep reading. It says, the trade for slaves in the river of Senegal was chiefly with the Moors on the northern banks who got them very often by war and not seldom by kidnapping. That is, lying in wait near a village where there was no open war and seizing whom they could. That the Moors used to cross the synagogue to catch the Negroes. Uh-oh. Let me read that again. It says, that the Moors used to cross the Senegal to catch the Negroes. Now, I just want to point out, fam, that in some of these old books, the Moors are different than the Negroes, right? They're not the same people. Let's keep reading. That's the topic for another day. As it reads, General Rook says that kidnapping took place in the neighborhood of Gori. It was
is spoken of as commonplace, right? So he's talking about the taking of slaves, whether it be kidnapping, whether it be from war. Let's keep reading, fam. Let's go to page two where it says, Mr. Dalrymple found that the great droves called caravans of slaves brought from inland by way of Gala to Senegal and Gambia were prisoners of war. Oh, well, there's that war again, fam. We're going to come back to that. It says, those sold to vessels at Gori and near it were procured by the grand pillage, that's important, the lesser pillage, or by robbery of individuals or in consequence of crimes. The grand pillage is executed by the king's soldiers from 300 to 3,000 at a time who attack and set fire to a village and seize the inhabitants as they can. The smaller parties generally lie in wait about the villages and take off all they can surprise, which is also done by individuals who do not belong to the king, but are private robbers. All right, again, this is what Hillary was talking about, right? This is what she was talking about in her interview. Let's keep reading, fam, to see if that's the root or if that's further down the supply chain. Mr. Watchstone, those slaves to be procured between Senegal and Gambia, either by the general pillage or by robbery, by individuals or by stratagem and deceit. The general pillage is executed by the king's troops on horseback who seize the unprepared. Mr. Watchstone, during the week he was at Joel, accompanying one of those embassies which the French governor sends yearly with presents to the kings to keep up the slave trade. Hmm. Saw parties sent out for this purpose by King Barbicent almost every day. Hmm. Well, we're obviously going to come back to this man. The part in green that you see on your screen is highlighting something that we'll get to later, which talks about certain things being sent to these kings to perpetuate the slave trade. We'll come back to that in a minute. But let's keep reading, Finn. We want to make sure we understand what the Native African participation was in the transatlantic slave trade. So let's just make sure we understand that first before we go to chapter two. All right, so let's keep reading. It says, whatever rivers he has traded in, such as the Sierra Leone, Junk, and the Little Cape Mountain, he has usually passed burnt and, and deserted villages and learned from the natives in the boat with him that war had been there and that the natives had been taken in the manner as before described and carried to the ships. All right, so there's that war again, fam. Remember, what we were taught in school, fam, was that the Africans were war with each other and that the slaves were the result of war, right? Keep that in mind, fam, because this book will explain what they mean by war. All right, so next reference, next page reads, slaves, says Mr. Town. Now, this is Mr. Town's testimony. It says, are brought from the country very distant from the coast. The king of Bara informed Mr. Town that on the arrival of a ship, he has gone 300 miles up the country with his guard and driven down Capus to the seaside. So basically he says that when the ships arrive, when he goes 300 miles up the country with his guards and drive down the captives to the ships. Meribah, king of the Mondingos, he has heard that they had marched slaves out of the country some 100 miles, that they had gone wood ranging of everyone they met with, whom they stripped naked. Now fam, this is another important aspect of slavery. You need to know that the slaves were not naked <laughs> when they got it, right? The custom was, when they captured slaves, when these Africans, Native Africans captured the slaves, they would strip them naked. That's why when you see these pictures of slaves being lowered onto ships that they're naked, it's not that they were naked hanging in trees, right? It's because their clothes were taken from them. Let's keep reading. It says, whom they strip naked, and if men bound, but if women brought down loose. This he had from themselves, and also that they often went to war with the Bolomish on purpose to get slaves. So they're going to war on purpose to get slaves. Let's keep reading the highlighted sections. Drop down to the bottom where it says, in the Gilanus River, he knew four blacks to seize a man who had been to the seaside to sell one or more slaves. This man was returning home with the goods received in exchange for these, and they plundered and stripped him naked. All right, so here they go again. When they capture them, they strip them naked. All right, let's keep reading. They plundered him, they stripped him naked, and brought him to the trading shop, which Mr. Town commanded, and sold him there. He believes that the natives also sometimes become slaves in consequence of crimes, as well as it is no uncommon thing on the coast to impute crimes falsely for the sake of selling the person so accused. Right? So basically, they would sometimes make up crimes to sell the person as a slave. 
Alright, thank you. Let's keep reading. He says, Genesis 6 says, From what he saw, he believes the slave trade is the occasion of wars among the natives. From the natives of the Windward Coast, he understood that the villages were always at war and that the black traders and others gave as a reason for it that the kings wanted slaves. So again, the purpose of these wars, family, of what they're calling wars, is to get slaves. That's important. The purpose of these wars were to get slaves. And the purpose of all this, this unrest in Africa was to get slaves. But the question is, what was the root? What caused it, right? So let's keep reading. It says, Dr. Trotter, having often asked Accra, a principal trader at Nihu, what he meant by prisoners of war, found they were such as were carried off by a sect of marauders who ravaged the country for that purpose. The Bushmen making war to make trade, that is to make slaves, was a common way of speaking among the traders. The practice was also confirmed by the slaves on board. So again, fam, the purpose of these wars was to make slaves. That was the purpose of this unrest. Let's keep reading. Lieutenant Simpson heard at Cape Coast Castle and other parts of the Gold Coast repeatedly from black traders that the slave trade made wars in Palavers. Mr. Kuko, chaplain at Cape Coast Castle, informed him that wars were made in the interior parts for the sole purpose of being slaves. This common thing, right? This common thing, these wars, this unrest. The purpose of that was to get slaves. It says, page 14, we go for it. Mr. Falconbridge does not believe that many of these slaves are prisoners of war, as we understand the word war. So, fam, in Africa, a practical expedition for making slaves is termed that again, fam, because this is something that you won't get in your institutions of learning in the United States. And it reads, in Africa, a practical expedition for making slaves is termed war. In other words, fam, in Africa, when they say war, they're meaning something a little bit different than what the Western mind understands what war is, right? So back during that time, when they mentioned the word war, they were talking about an expedition for making slaves. That's important. Let's keep reading fast. It says, a considerable trader at Bonnie explained to him the meaning of this word and said that they went in the night, set fires to a town, caught the people as they fled from the flames. The same trader said that this practice was very common. Again, fam, this is first-hand testimony, right? These are, these are people that were there in Africa, right? They were getting their testimony from the Africans themselves, right, fam? These are people that are there in Africa. And this testimony is, is being given to the House of Commons in England, right? The Parliament, right? So, fam, just keep that in mind. Like, this was understood in the Parliament in the 1700s, right? When they were talking about war, they knew that the war meant it was an expedition against slaves. But let's keep reading to understand what the UK Parliament, the House of Commons, in the 1700s, not only understood what the term war meant, but also understood what the source and the root of slavery in Africa was. Let's keep reading, Fanny says. And just to give you a bio of Falcon Bridge, Falcon Bridge had four voyages to Africa for slaves. He was the one that was giving that testimony. Now we're going to read about the testimony of Mr. Morley, where it says, Mr. Morley states that in Old Calabar, persons are sold as slaves for adultery and theft. On pretense of adultery, he remembers a woman's soul. He has been told also by the natives at Calabar that they took slaves in what they call war, which he found was putting the villages in confusion and catching them as they could. That was war. And here's the bio of Mr. Morley, who gave his testimony. He was a gunner of His Majesty's ship, the Medway, made six voyages to Africa. So now let's read about the testimony of Mr. J. Parker, right? So it says, Mr. J. Parker says, He left the ship to which he belonged at Old Calabar, where being kindly received by the king's son, he stayed with him on the continent for five months. 
during this time, he was prevailed upon by the king's son to accompany him to war. Now, notice that there's some asterisk right there, but we're going to read about the asterisk here in a little bit. Let's keep reading. It says, Accordingly, having fitted out and armed the canoes, they went up the river Calabar. And in the daytime, they lay under the bushes when they approached the village. But at night, flew up to it and took hold of everyone they could see. These they handcuffed, brought down to the canoes, and so proceeded up the river till they got to the amount of forty-five, with whom they returned to Newtown, were sending to the captains of shipping. They divided them among the ships. So again, we're seeing that war was basically a slave raid. Right? War in Africa basically meant a slave raid. Here's Mr. Parkes Bayam, who was a shipkeeper of the Malampas frigate, which sailed in 1764 to the River Gambia, in 1765 to Port Calabar. He lived five months on shore at New Calabar. In the next page, he says, The king at Old Calabar was certainly not at war with the people of this world. Let me say that again for says, The king at Old Calabar was certainly not at war nor had they made any attack upon them. It happened that the slaves were very slack in the back country at the time and were wanted when he went on these expeditions. So basically, he needed slaves, right? The whole purpose of him doing what he was doing was to get slaves. But here's a, you'll see a, a portion here in blue, and this is where you see that asterisk, right? And this reader says, let's read this thing, it says, the reader is earnestly requested to take notice that the word war, as adopted into the African language, means in general robbery or marauding expedition for the purpose of getting slaves. Fam, this is the information that you need to catch, right? So that over in the states or different places, when they tell you that Africa got their slaves from war, now you know exactly what was meant when they say war. Let's keep reading, fam, because we haven't gotten to the root of what's causing this slave expeditions, what's causing the war, right? Let's keep reading. It says, and for this we're going to go to chapter 2. We're going to read about the Europeans. This, keep in mind, fam, this is the testimony that was given to the House of Commons in the 1700s, right? To the UK Parliament House of Commons in the 1700s. So this is what they understood to be the root from the first-hand testimonies. Let's read the fact says, Europeans, by means of the trade in slaves, the occasion of these enormities sometimes use additional means to incite the natives to practice them, often attempt themselves to steal the natives and succeed, force trade as they please. Okay. Alright, so this is kind of like the title part of this, but let's keep reading. It says, the more say have always a strong inducement to go to war with the Negroes. So again, it is the Moors going to war with the Negroes, right? It's the Moors that are going to get the Negroes. And of course, we know that war meant slave expeditions. Let's keep reading. Now we're going to read the testimony of Dr. Trotter, right? Dr. Trotter. So Dr. Trotter asking a black trader what they made of their slaves when the French and the English we're at war. Basically, he's asking them, hey man, what, what do you guys do with those slaves when English and the French aren't here? Right? When the English and French aren't here, what do you guys do? Because as Hillary and others have suggested, that Africans, even if the Europeans weren't there, that Africans would be capturing slaves anyway. Right? That this was just something that the Europeans just happened to take advantage of that was already taking place. But let's listen to the testimony of Dr. Trotter to see if he confirms this, right? So it says, Dr. Trotter asking the black trader what they made of their slaves when the French and the English were at war was answered. That when the ships ceased to come, slaves ceased to be taken. is 
father was a surgeon in the Royal Navy. He was a voyage in the African slave trade from Liverpool in 1783. That's an example. Let's keep reading this more. Let's read about the testimony from Mr. Ratchet. Mr. Ratchet says that King Burbison, while he, Mr. Ratchet, was at Joel, was unwilling to pillage his subjects, but he was excited to do it by means of constant intoxication. Kept up by the French and mulattoes. Now keep in mind the mulattoes, those Portuguese descendants that were sent to West Coast Africa to work as intermediaries on behalf of the Portuguese, right? They are the Portuguese agents in Africa working on behalf of Portugal. Let's go back to this reference because it says that he was excited to do it. So basically the king of Africa was being pushed to do it by means of constant intoxication. Those are all constantly trying to make him drunk, which was kept up by the French and the mulattoes of the embassy, who generally agreed every morning on taking this. Right? Every morning they're waking up saying, hey, would you go get some slaves? Hey, King, why don't you get some slaves? Hey, good morning, King. Why don't you get some slaves? It's constant, right? So it's this method to affect their purpose. When sober, he was always expressed a reluctant to harass his people. Mr. Rapstrom also heard the king hold the same language on different days. And yet, he afterwards ordered the pillage to be executed. Mr. Rapstrom has no doubt that he also pillages in other parts of his dominion since it is the custom of the mulatto merchants, as both they do and the French officers declare, when they want slaves, listen fam, to go to the king and excite them to pillage. Well, I'm going to leave it right there. But, uh, yeah, this is what it's about. But see, this is what they're trying to deny. So he had the truth. Shout out to Ben, ben Yi, Ben Yi, with Israel for bringing this out. So when they throw that at you, you heard it from this video. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this video because, sorry, it's so kind of long. But, um, I hope this was enlightening. And this is the reason why we're asking. That's why people are asking about reparations. And you see that every time when black people try to lift them upside the trap, they purposely sabotage them in 2023. They sabotage their health, they sabotage them, and try to see that they're not intellectually smart. But that proved to be the one video shows you that it, that's a lie. You see, it's deeper than what you think. So to my fellow black, black black people in diaspora, stay cheered. Because if they don't honor, remember it in, in that same book, as Egypt went, Rome went, Babylon went, then then all these other countries like America are gonna go if they don't do what is right. And even don't matter if we in the land, the curse will still hit. And then anybody agree, anybody that looks like us, they agree with them, they have to suffer too. You, you see what happened out there, all you have to do is pick up your Bible. Because the Bible is the next next truth along with, with historical facts. Until this day. So, let them be denied what is due. America would continually lose money until she makes what's right due by the, the original people that the one the people that started out in the land. All right then, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, share it, like it with somebody, subscribe, you know. All right then, you guys have a blessed one, and hopefully educate you, see you soon on the next video. Take care.